This is the second half of a lecture on microbial interactions um, and the human microbiome, focusing specifically on um, the, what the human microbiome is, why it's important, um, how it's established, and as well as the diversity of uh, microbiota of different parts of the body. And so the human microbiome is basically defined as all of the microbes, all of the bacteria, fungi, and archaea that are associated with a healthy human host. And the human body at any one time can contain 10 times as many bacterial cells as it does human cells. And so the microbiome, while invisible to the naked eye, is integral to human survival um, and makes up a huge portion of our body mass compared to the size of bacterial cells. And so if you think about how small a bacterial cell is, um, it's interesting to find that one to three percent of our body mass as humans is made up of only bacterial cells um, and nothing else. And that means that if you're a person who weighs a hundred pounds, you're carrying around from anywhere from one to three pounds of bacterial cells at any given time. And bacteria can occupy specific niches or specific parts of the body. Those niches are often dictated by the age of the human, um, the diet, so gut microbiome um, can be determined and changed by dietary factors. Um, some niches are also defined by gender, as well as environmental factors. And we know a lot about the human microbiome through work that's been supported by the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH. <coughs> and this project is known as the Human Microbiome Project. It was started in 2007, and since then, um, using metagenomics and 16S, our RNA sequencing, um, scientists have been able to identify and characterize the microbes that occupy all of these different niches and different parts of the human body. And so originally when scientists were studying sort of the human microbiome, it was necessary for them to culture all of the microbes um, that were living either in or on parts of our body. And um, that kind of poses a problem, right? Because some microbes are unable to be cultured under laboratory conditions because it's difficult to choose laboratory conditions, right? The correct media, the correct level of oxygen, the correct temperature for microbes um, that you're trying to identify because you don't know how to grow things if you don't know what's there. And so by using 16S sequencing, uh, the scientists were able to kind of circumvent the need for cultivating and culturing um, human microbiota in the lab, and they were able to completely identify all of these microbiome components um, in different parts of the body that they might not have been able to grow and culture in the lab before. And so it really expanded our knowledge of how large and diverse the human microbiome is. And so we are not born with a microbiome. We actually are born, or we are, um, grown in utero um, in a germ-free environment within the uterus and then during the moment of birth we start require, re acquiring our microbiome. Um, if it's a natural birth, um, most of these microbes are acquired from the mother. Um, cesarean section births, a lot of the microbiome um, is transferred via the parents but also some microbiome of the primary caregivers like nurses and doctors has been shown to be involved in kind of establishing this first microbiome for infants. And our microbiomes can change as we age, and that's through um, several different factors, both innate factors like genetics and developmental stage or age, as well as environmental factors like what we eat, um, hygiene, whether we, how often we, you know, wash our hands and our faces, whether we use different types of cosmetic products, um, as well as life events such as travel, um, stress, early illnesses, um, where we live um, in different regions of the world, as well as 
how socialized we are with other people, um, how much contact we have with animals and other organisms. Um, <coughs> and so while we're developing from birth to adulthood, you can see that the microbial diversity and stability in this graph on the right both increase. And then at adulthood, we've sort of peaked in both diversity and stability, and that tends to actually stay pretty much the same for the rest of adulthood. Um, there's a slight decrease in the stability of the microbiome um, in patients or in, in people who are older, um, mostly due to declining uh, both fitness and immune response um, in aging humans. But overall, um, once we establish our microbiome um, as adolescents, it stays pretty stable as adults. One major factor that can change an adult's microbiome is a long-term illness or bacterial infection. And so a long-term bacterial infection might <laughs> completely change the landscape of a particular uh, microbiota in whichever part of the body that's infected. So if you have a gut infection, it's possible that their gut microbiome can completely change as a result. Um, Adult microbiomes can also change in response to long-term treatment with antibiotics for these particular diseases, because you can imagine that a broad-spectrum antibiotic um, and being exposed to that for a long time could have major impacts on microbiomes in different parts of your body. And additionally, there are some changes that are sort of um, illness-specific that can actually change your microbiome as a result. And so one of the, or a couple of these are um, obesity and type two diabetes. So in patients who have um, both insulin resistance, inflammatory bowel disease, type two diabetes, you can see that patients have a different microbiome makeup um, in their gut than healthy controls do. And so not only being exposed to sort of a bacterial illness, but also having particular illnesses that don't have to do with bacteria can um, change your microbiome as well. And so even though there are so many microbial cells, um, <laughs> as well as a huge amount of diversity in which types of bacteria those are, when you're trying to, when, um, when scientists began classifying them in the Human Microbiome Project, they actually noticed that at least as of the writing of this last edition of the book, most of the bacteria fall into only five different bacterial phyla. I think that number might be closer to eight now um, since they've been working between uh, this last edition of the book and 2020, but still it's not as many phyla as you would expect. It's, um, however, within these five phyla, there are tons and tons of different species in each that make up the microbiome. And this picture here is just to illustrate how different parts of your body have different uh, phyla of bacteria that they favor. So for example, here in the external auditory canal or the outside of your ear, firmicutes are favored over proteobacteria, um, which is different than say, this part um, of your forearm, where proteobacteria seem to be the highest um, and actinobacteria the lowest. And so it's important to remember that while <coughs> um, there are um, different phyla and species of bacteria, there's also different makeups of, um, or different members of all of these phyla at different parts of the body. And so just to highlight some of that diversity of the human microbiome in specific organ systems, I'm going to talk a little bit about the skin first. So there are 10 to the 12 bacterial cells on the skin at all times. Some bacteria are transient and some sort of permanently colonize different areas of the skin. And so if you look at this image here, what you can see is that each color represents a different type of bacteria. And if you look down at these pie charts, you can see that the color makeup of all the different pie charts or the bacterial makeup of those particular areas is all different. And it's usually depending on what type of um, what type of skin secretions you have in that area, as well as how much exposure it has to the external environment. 
And so the areas that tend to have the highest diversity, which I find a bit interesting, are actually the drier areas of your skin, not the moist areas um, or the ones that have oily secretions, the sebaceous areas. Um, so it seems like in terms of diversity, a dry area of skin will have higher diversity, but um, as kind of expected, an area that has a lot of sweat and oils will have the most amount of bacteria. And so sheer numbers tend to be concentrated around those sebaceous areas of the skin where there are sweat and oil glands. And particularly, this is true, um, there's a lot of gram negative or gram positive bacteria found in these regions. Um, and one sort of interesting factoid is that a lot of deodorants actually contain antimicrobials specific to gram positives because gram positives are the ones that are the bacteria that actually um, eat and metabolize sweat and oil in your, um, in your armpit. And when they do, they produce um, unpleasant smelling volatile compounds. And so by killing the gram positives, with a deodorant, you actually are killing the ability to make some of those unpleasant smells that are associated uh, with sweat um, and armpits. And so in terms of like your oral cavity, the nose and the mouth, there are some pretty common species that tend to inhabit both of these regions. Um, in your nose, you'll find a lot of staph, both staph aureus and staph epidermis. Um, Whereas in your mouth, as well as in your throat, there tend to be many, many Streptococcus species, as well as several Neisseria species, which is uh, the type of bacteria that actually causes gonorrhea. Um, and so your mouth, we tend to think that this is like a great place for microbes to thrive, and it is in terms of nutrients and water and temperature. It's a nice, moist, wet environment for them. However, in your mouth, you need to realize that these bacteria also need to be resistant to mechanical stress. And so um, mouth bacteria tend to form biofilms like you'll find on the plaque of your teeth in order to be um, able to adhere and stay in that environment and resist sort of these mechanical stresses. And your gut is sort of where we have the largest community of microbes in our in, um in our body. Very few bacteria can actually survive in the stomach because the pH is way too low. It's much too acidic for microbe growth. But the amount and diversity of microbes increases um, as you enter the intestines and the farther you get away from the stomach in the gut, the more uh, microbes you have and the more diversity there is. And so in the large intestine or the colon, we find the most microbes um, in any part of our body. And as you can imagine, um, internal organs tend to favor enteric bacteria or anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that don't require a lot of oxygen to live. And sort of, we have to remember as well that this bacterial population that inhabits our gut and helps us obtain nutrients from food is really imperative to our survival. Um, but we get rid of it through excretion of waste um, every time that we eat, right? And so the bacterial population in the colon is not only huge, but it's also doubling every day, sometimes one or two times, in order to replace all the microbes that are lost through excretion of food. So it's a really large and well-maintained and um, highly growing um, microbiota. And the last thing to remember is that not every part of the body is going to have a microbiota or a microbiome. There are some parts of your body that are not meant to be inhabited by microbes. The respiratory tract um, and the lungs specifically is one of those places. In fact, there are um, cilia that actually are designed to beat um, any dust, dirt, and microbes out of the respiratory tract um, because inhabiting and um, because a bacteria inhabiting the lungs ends up causing infection and disease. And this is the case of all of these other systems as well. So the brain, um, the cardiovascular system, and the blood, the muscles, as well as the kidneys and most of the urinary tract do not have a normal microbiome. Um, and when microbes do inhabit these areas, it leads to pretty serious bacterial infections um, that are not only painful, but that can also actually lead to death. 
such as in the blood or in the nervous system.